together tonight to, to celebrate what you give to us each and every day, Lord. To thank you for the wonderful things that you provide to us and we oftentimes don't even realize. Father, but most of all, we come tonight to come closer to you. Father, to bring our hearts to you, to open our hearts completely, totally and honestly to you, Lord. And Father, we just ask that you come into those hearts, that you fill those hearts with the love that you have for each and every one of us. Father, tonight we just ask you be with Dr. Anderson in the word he's already prepared, Father, from you. And Father, let us be mindful that those words are meant not only for us to sit here and enjoy right now, but to take out to the world around us and to share with each and every person we come in contact with. Lord. We just thank you. We praise you. We give you all glory and honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kevin Johnson. Let's start off tonight's 7 o'clock hour by singing the great old Kirk Tally number, Step Into the Water. If you're willing and Lord willing you are and you're able, stand up, clap along and let's sing Step Into the Water. Thank you. 
T-shirts, yeah. Rita Laughlin. Yes. She's in the hospital in North Kansas City, and uh, they scheduled today, Friday, they're going to have to amputate her leg, her right leg above the knee. She has diabetes really, really bad, has had it for years. And uh, so I would just ask if you would please keep her in your prayers. Uh, the surgery is at 2 o'clock, Carol. 2 o'clock uh, Friday afternoon is when the, the uh, surgery is scheduled. 
and uh, just keep her in your prayers as, as uh, that time approaches for her. And I know that there's others, and uh, like the, the gentleman, uh, one of the gentlemen that plays the uh, violin, his wife is really ill. And so if they can't get here this evening, uh, we'll catch them another time. And one other thing that I might uh, remind you, mercystream.com. And uh, let your friends know. Uh, if you have military personnel in your church, let them know. Uh, missionaries, send them an email and tell them about how they can watch it uh, on mercystream.com. And so share that information with others because uh, it, it is amazing how many people through the year uh, will watch that. And so keep that in mind. And then also as a reminder, this next year in 2018, we, we will be back over at the fairgrounds. Now I know this week there's been a lot of people that have made comments about how they so enjoyed being here at Weston in the Klein's Opera Building. And it is very nice. It's very comfortable. It's easy for us to set up. So when you see Ted, make sure you give him a big hug and a big thank you. And so it, it, it's so nice of him to allow us to use the facilities here. And so please let him know how much you appreciate that. But she's, yes, give him a hand. And uh, by 2018, we'll be back over to fairgrounds. Now, our next business meeting, our planning meeting, I'll call it this, was scheduled for August the 21st, I believe that's a Monday, but I think that's the, yeah. So, uh, we're, we're, we're thinking that there's, it, it may not be that a lot of people won't come because of that, but it may be because they can't get there for the traffic. So, I, I'm thinking we're probably going to go ahead and reschedule that for September, the third Monday evening in September. And we have those meetings at the Baptist Church in Platte City because it's kind of centrally located in the county. And the church there is very nice in allowing us to do that. So uh, watch for the emails. And, and let me say this, that if any of you are interested in working with the committee as we make plans for these different uh, meetings, please let me know. Give me your email address and I'll give it to the ones that send out this information and uh, so you'll know about it. But then starting in January... Starting in January, the third Monday of every month up till the time in August, uh, we'll, we'll be having a uh, planning meeting. So if you're interested, please come. And we're always looking for new ideas, new ways to reach the community and to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you want to be a part of that, please come and uh, be a part of that. Now, just a couple of quick other announcements. Don't forget in the back... Uh, ladies from about four different, five different churches have been, have been bringing cookies. And I'm going to tell you right now, tonight you're going to have to eat more than one or two. <laughs> so be sure, and if nothing else, take a napkin, wrap up two or three, and take them with you. And so that, uh, be sure and get those cookies. And uh, there's a bottle of water back there if anybody wants a bottle of water. And please, Daryl Wilson and his family and Bryce and all of the musicians and everyone that's in the choir have done a fantastic job. I've really enjoyed this music. So thank you, God. Thank you all.
message this evening. There's some fellow that's ducking down over there and coming up here. Oh, well, I didn't know you were here again tonight. Well, let's give it up for Dr. Jim Anderson. What an opportunity it is for me to be back here with you. And uh, I have one verse of scripture that you'll be able to find. It's in the last book of the Bible. It's the last chapter of the last book of the Bible. And it's verse 17. And uh, we'll use other scriptures, but this is our primary scripture that we're looking at tonight. And so, if... Uh, if it's difficult to stand, don't worry, don't stand. But if it's easy enough to stand up, let's stand for the reading of God's Word in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. Let him who is a thirst, Come. And whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. Shall we go to our Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that's preceded this moment. Thank you for these Christian musicians who have played the music, who have sung the songs, who have led us, and the choir that sung, and all the people who are here, all participating, to praise your name in song. Thank you for those who have uh, also given the announcements and the time of prayer. And we do pray for those that have been mentioned, having surgery, having sickness, having difficulties, that you would be with them and guide the physicians, the nurses, the procedures, the medications, but we know the healing comes from you. And so we pray that it might be in your will that you might be pleased to raise them up, even though miraculously so, but that otherwise there might be realized a purpose for uh, the, a health issue where they might reach some people they could not have reached otherwise. We commend them unto you, we commend you to them, and we thank you for the results because you are a caring and loving God who takes care of our needs. Lord, we thank you for this uh, Opry House that's been made available. Thank you for the ones who own it and operate it, that they have made it available. And I thank you for this uh, committee and for Pastor Jimmy in leading and other pastors in coming and helping to bring people out. I thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to serve here with them. But we know that this is not man's word that is given. It's not man's word that we read. It's your word, the word of God, given by inspiration. Though you used human instrumentality, you were in charge and the product was exactly what you intended. And you've allowed that word to be given down in various languages, even in our own, that we might understand it. 
And we pray that your Holy Spirit who gave the word might touch our hearts and minds and souls. That we might receive this word. That we might understand this word. That we might apply this word. And that we might proclaim this word. That others might know you. Oh, we pray for those who are here tonight. That you would bless each heart and mind and soul. That you would be exalted and glorified. That this, your servant, would be hidden. That Christ would be exalted. And we'll thank you for all the blessings that will be ours. As this is so. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's been uh, really wonderful to be back here. Uh, many years ago, in 1954, I pastored uh, a church that's not far from here, and down P Road, and as it goes around the cemetery, and that uh, the little red building now as it is, the Pleasant Ridge Baptist Church, built in 1844, and the clay on which it sits was the clay they used to make the bricks in that building. And I've never forgotten the great blessings that we had there while preaching the Word. And uh, then uh, there was uh, a young lady that went with my folks and me up there, and she talked to little Sunday school children. And uh, her name was Diana Allman, and uh, I married her. And <laughs> she's sitting right out here. Wave at them, Diana. She's been putting up with me as her husband this Sunday for 62 years. <laughs> August the 13th didn't come on the Sunday that week, but anyway, it was August the 13th in 1950. What year was that? Listen, <laughs> 1955. Yes, and. Uh, you know, the first time I saw her, I was 10 years old. We lived on a little country road that wasn't cut through. Now it's cut through and it's even paid. But uh, I, I would ride my bike down that country road. But of course, any time it would rain, we'd have uh, mud and have ruts. And so uh, I would ride my bike like this. I didn't hold on to the handlebars. I would guide it, you know, with my knees and leaning. And, and so... Uh, this new family moved in down at the bottom of the hill and uh, they had two girls I wanted to see what those girls looked like and so I was going down there and they were playing in their front yard out close to the road and uh, so here I'm riding like this and as I looked over to see I got in one of those ruts and I went flying and I fell right at her feet the first time I saw her. <laughs> well, it ended up and that uh, she was the only girl I ever dated. And then we married in 1955. We have four children. We had a fifth that didn't live very long, but she's in heaven. And I know I'm going to see her again. We named her Rachel. But uh, uh, our oldest child, Becky, has retired from teaching. And, she, <laughs> and she's a grandma. Well, I can't believe that. But uh, our next child, he's a grandpa. And so we have uh, 10 grandchildren, but we have 12 great-grandchildren. And so the Lord has blessed us in a wonderful way. And it's so good to be back up in the area to see many that we've known before and to meet some new folks that we had not met before. And uh, thank you for allowing us the privilege. Now as we uh, look into the sacred scripture, you'll note that this verse that we've read is an invitation. And it's the last invitation that's in the Bible. But stop and think, what if it were God's last invitation to you. What if you've never accepted Him as Savior and He has invited you and others have invited you and others have prayed for you and this is your last chance? I don't know that it is, but I know this is the last invitation in the Bible. And what if it were God's last invitation to you and you failed to accept it 
tonight and found that you had rejected Christ for the very last time and you would never again have an opportunity to hear His call. Never again an opportunity to respond in faith. Never again the opportunity to be saved from your sins. Never, never again an opportunity to go to heaven. That this would be the last sermon you would ever hear. And you could never be saved. That's a solemn thought. And I hope we think much about it. The Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 16 that it came to be that way with many of Israel. And here's what it says. But they mocked the messengers of God. They despised His words. They misused His prophets until the wrath of God rose against the people and there was no more remedy. It was gone. The Scripture tells us in other places like in Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. In Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6, it says, Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call ye upon Him while He is near. And Luke chapter 16 and verse 15 says, But many tried to justify themselves before God, but it says, But God knew their hearts and God knows our hearts. And that which may be seemed may seem to be highly esteemed among men is but abomination in the sight of God. Well again in Revelation we have the last book of the revealed truth of God for us. And this is the last chapter of the last book in the Bible. And in chapter 20, he spoke of the last judgment that would come upon the unbelievers who would stand before Him and their works not blotted out would show their sins. And the Lamb's Book of Life, where their names are blotted out, did not show them as free from guilt. And so we come to this last chapter and God having spoken about the judgment that's coming, Yet out of love, out of mercy, and out of grace, he says to John, don't close the writing yet. Give them one more invitation to accept me and receive my saving grace. God gives the last invitation. And so we ask that if you do not know him, in the free pardon and forgiveness of sin, that you come to Him, trusting Him, being saved by His mercy and grace tonight. The Spirit and the Bride say come. Let him who hears say come. Let him who is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him come. Let him take the water of life freely. There are four things I'd like to briefly point out from this passage of Scripture. First of all, the communicators of this invitation. Who is it that God has sent out to invite people to trust in Him? The communicators. Secondly, the called ones. Who are called? Who are invited by this invitation to come? Third, the content of the invitation. What is it that He invites you to have? And finally, the consequences of the invitation. What does it mean if you accept it? And what does it mean if you reject it? First then, the communicators. 
He says, the Spirit says, come. The Bride says, come. And whoever hears, tell others to come. The Spirit, of course, is the Spirit of God. And the Bible does tell us that the Holy Spirit draws people unto Him. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verse 9, it says that He is the light and life of the world, and He draws all unto Him. The Spirit convicts all to come to Him. We read in the Gospel of John chapter 16. We also read in John chapter 6 and verse 44 that the Father draws people unto Him. We read in Romans chapter 1 and verses 19 through 21 that the Father has been in the business of making Himself known to us since the time of creation. And those who do not know Him are those who reject that which He has provided. And they pervert His Word and therefore He gives them over to their chosen unbelief. Uh, they uh, despise His person and have idols and therefore He gives them over to their unbelief. And they despise His plan for life and have homosexuality and have bestiality and have lesbianism and despising God's plan for human life. And therefore He gives them over to the most indescribable evils that are described in the rest of Romans chapter 1. The Spirit, however, calls us. The Spirit, however, convicts us. But often people don't listen. And then He says, and the bride says, come. Who is the bride of our Lord? The one who is spiritually united with the Lord or the redeemed of the church. It says the church is the bride of Christ and the church, that is, the believing church. Now the earthly churches often have people who have joined the church and never joined Jesus. The Laodiceans had become like that. The people at Sardis had become like that in the times of John. And so it says to Sardis, you call yourself by a name, but you're dead in God's sight. He speaks of the Laodiceans and he says, you've left Christ on the outside. He's knocking at the door. He wants to be on the inside, but you've let him out. And the Bible tells us that the devil sows the seed of sinfulness among the wheat of the church. But when the angels come to separate them out, they're not fooled by this facade of self-righteousness, this facade of religiosity. They see the heart and they gather up the tares and cast them into the fire. But the church, which is His bride, those who truly have been born of God and born by the Spirit of God, they'll be gathered unto Him and there'll be a great marriage supper of the Lamb that the book of Revelation tells us about in chapter 21. 20, that is, and also other places in the Bible. So the, the bride is the church of the believing people who are to give forth a message to the world to come unto Christ. Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 25 and following tell us about the husband and wife relationship, and it tells us that this is a, a symbol of of the relationship of Christ with His church. And he says that really what I'm talking about is the church. And so that which is in union with Christ, being born again and brought into union with Him, is the bride on earth that's to give forth a testimony. The great commission of Christ was given to the church. And he says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. But the book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse 8 tells us, it's not just the collective body of the church. It's not just the earthly churches that are to send people out. It's everybody who's born by the Spirit of God. And therefore this passage says the Spirit and the Bride. And whosoever has heard, has listened, has responded to the message and knows it to be true. Is to say, come, 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 come. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Jesus said, after that you are endued with power from on high. After that, the Spirit of God has come to infuse the power of God in the life of the church. He says, after that, you are to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, your hometown, in Judea, the surrounding countryside, in Samaria, their enemy's country, 
and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Who has the Spirit of God? Well, the Bible tells us it's the people who are born again of God. And Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 says, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you don't belong to it. So all the people who belong to it, not just the embodied church as a group, and not just the Holy Spirit as a Word of God is communicated through Him to illumine our minds and to convict our hearts, but every born again man and woman and boy and girl are responsible under God to bear witness of Him. This then becomes the communicators of this great invitation as He says in Revelation 22, 17. But secondly, who are those that they're to go out and call? It says those who are thirsting for righteousness. Those who've been out in the barren deserts of this world and they found it not to satisfy and the desire, the living water of God. They are the ones who are called to come and to drink freely of these springs of grace. It's like the woman at the well. We often go there and that well of Jacob and Shechem and Sychar is still there. And we often draw up that water and we drink some of that water from that well that's still very deep. And it was the well that this woman had gone to and Jesus asked her for a drink of water. Well, he was a Jew. She was a Samaritan. Uh, they didn't talk to each other. And she was a woman, and he's a man. And uh, you didn't speak to a woman if you were a stranger unless you were introduced to her by a male member of her clan. And so this was quite a shock to this woman that Jesus would speak to her. And then he asked her a favor. He asked her uh, if she would allow him to give her a drink of water. And she said, no, oh, this is more confusing than ever. I'm the one that has the drawing vessel. You have nothing. And the well is deep. How can you give me a, 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 a drink of water? And he says, the water that you're talking about is the physical water that can satisfy the thirst of the body for a short time. But I'm talking about a living water. And when you drink of it, it will satisfy your spiritual thirst forevermore. And she said, oh, tell me about this. But she said, wait a minute. We, we worship from Mount Gerizim here. And uh, you worship down to Jerusalem. And he says, the place makes no difference. For God is spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. It's not the earthly place. It's not an earthly mountain. It's the God of all creation that you need to worship. And He's the one who has a living water. Well, she drank of that living water and ran into town and tell, told the others about it. And they came out and Jesus led many of the Samaritans to trust in Him. On another occasion, Jesus was in the city of Jerusalem and it was during one of their great festivals, the feast uh, that ends the, the festival year, in fact, where they have the Feast of the Trumpets and the Yom Kippur, the Feast of Atonement, and where they have the Feast of Sukkot. And at the end of the feast, they would have a grand celebration. And there would be three processionals of the priests that would start from the temple platform. And uh, one would go out to prepare uh, palm branches around the altar to decorate it. Another would go out to slay the sacrificial lamb that would be sacrificed and offered unto God upon that altar. But the third, most important it was, would go down with the high priest leading the procession down the hill of Moriah, down the hill of Ophel, and down to the Siloam pool that had been established in the time of Hezekiah in 701 B.C. And there, there, he would take the golden vessel from the temple and he would dip into the waters of the Siloam pool. He'd come back up and uh, the three processions would be gathering at the same time. The offering would have been sacrificed and out placed there. The decorations would have been made there. And the priest would stand up and pour out the water, symbolizing that God would pour out the living water and refresh their souls. And then there was a, a holy hush, after which the hallelujah chorus would be sung, their hallelujah chorus and the choristers of the priest would sing. It must have been during that interval of silence that Jesus stood up on a stone, and you read about it in John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. And He said these words, If any man thirst, let him come unto Me and receive 
the living waters. And then it says, the spakey of the Holy Spirit that would be poured out upon those who believe. So it is. The Spirit and the bride say, come. And the people who are called are those who are thirsty and want to drink of that living, cleansing water from the Lord. And then it's not only those who want it, but it's those who are willing to come for it. For He said, whosoever will can come. Not just those who are thirsty, but those who are willing to come to get that drink of living water. Whosoever will may come. And so it is that in John 3.16, perhaps the most known verse of Scripture among the world, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. In Romans chapter 10 it says, For whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved in verse 13. So it is that those who are willing may come. It's like the prodigal that's described for us in Luke chapter 15 and verse 18 where he was able to come back to the Father. It was when he said, I will arise and go home. And maybe there's someone here tonight that you need to arise and answer God's call. Arise and accept His grace. Arise and trust Him before it's eternally too late. Now notice the contents of this invitation. We noted the communicators of it. We've noted the ones called by it. Now what are the contents of it? Well, its contents, He said, to come to me. That is, to enter the presence of the Lord. It's just as, as Jesus said, which we quoted last night from Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. All ye who are labor and are heavy laden, come, and I will give you rest. Jesus opens wide His arms to all, saying, come, and I will give you rest. And then it's not only to enter the presence of the Lord, to come to the Lord, but it's also to drink of the water of life, to receive that cleansing, that refreshing, that Holy Spirit of God. And then to receive a free gift because He says, come, and drink freely of this living water. You see, we don't deserve to be saved. We are all sinners. We have come short of the glory of God. We have a sin nature that we've inherited from Adam, and we have a sin conduct that responds to that nature as we come to an age of accountability. We make the decision to sin, and God knows all about it. But He says, I've got a free gift for you if you'll receive it. Oh, how Jesus wept for the people of Jerusalem and how He said to them, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sinned unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children unto me as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings but ye would not. But ye would not. But ye would not. They turned down His invitation. Many of them. And died without hope. So the Scripture says, For by grace, that's unmerited favor. For by grace are you saved. Through faith. Not of yourselves. Not this work of yourself. But it's a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith, of that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the consequences of the invitation, the communicators, the call, the contents, what are the consequences? He says to receive the water of life. To receive life. 1 John 5, 12 says, He who has the Son has life. To receive life. Life that means you are forgiven of your sins. Like Romans 10, 4 says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness sake for all who believe. It's forgiveness. Life because of forgiveness. But it's life that establishes a freedom from sin and from Satan and a freedom with God. 
And so Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Don't let anyone steal away from you this freedom that God provides you. And in John chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus said, I give you the truth, and the truth will set you free. Again, He says that in verse 36. It's a fulfillment as well. Not only is it a life that's because of forgiveness, a life that establishes freedom, but it's a life that manifests fulfillment. It gives you purpose for living. It gives you a new life. A life that's worth having. And the power to live a life that's worth living. All else is vain. It will pass away. But this life is a fulfilling life in the purpose of God. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, he speaks of those who are given over to the flesh and over to Satan and temptation. And then he speaks of those beginning with verse 22 through 24 that are given over to the things of God. Having the Spirit and the fruit, the result of His presence. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, and temperance or self-restraint. And there's no laws to restrict that. But the laws are to restrict the things of the flesh. And so it is that we have fulfillment when we come to Christ. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26, the Lord said to His disciples, those who will seek to save their lives and to themselves, lose the value of it. Those who are willing to lose themselves unto Christ and serve Him, they find the value of life. Seek it for yourself and you lose its value. Give it unto Christ and you find its value is what that says. Well, it's life that's a consequence of receiving the invitation, but it's also the opposite. It's death as a result of rejecting it. Having said in John 3.18, as he was speaking to Nicodemus, Jesus said, he who believes is not condemned. But then he says, but he who believes not is condemned and that already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Having said in 1 John 5, 12, the first part that we gave you a while ago, he that hath the Son hath life, it goes on to say, but, in contrast to that, but, he that hath not the Son of God, hath not life. So the consequences is either life or death. Romans tells us the wages of sin are death. And here in chapter 22 of Revelation, you'll know verses 18 and 19. Those who would add to the Word of God their own ideologies, their own ways, their own views, their own uh, types of ceremonies for salvation or whatever, to them will be added the judgments that are mentioned in this book. And for those who will take away from it and try to distort it and discard the portions of the Scripture they don't like, from them shall be taken the blessings that are found in the sacred scripture. So, we all have a choice to make. Either to accept the life that he offers or to reject it. The question I would ask is something I'd like for you to ask yourself. What is your decision? You can't put it off forever. There is a day of judgment coming. Jesus said, Behold, in this chapter, I come quickly. Time is running out. I remember a gentleman that was put in the hospital at Smithville when they had the old hospital down close to the river's edge. I had visited him before and he said, well, some other time. He was very ill. I went to see him. He was in pain and he seemed to be almost on the brink of accepting Christ. But he said, not now, not now. I went back to see him and they had him doped up pretty good and so he felt pretty good and 
He said, you know, I don't think I'm going to die yet. I've got a long time to live. And so I'll think about it some other time. I got a call the next morning. He died that night in the Smithville Hospital. Jesus talked about a man who was a very wealthy farmer. And it's mentioned in the Gospel of Luke chapter 12 and verses 16 to 21. He said, this farmer said, you know, I'm so prosperous that I need new barns. I'll tear down my old ones and I'll build new ones. And I'll have all of this. But God said, thou fool, tonight thy soul shall be required of thee. It was the last invitation. And that man blew it. He had an opportunity, but he forsook it. I remember a, a young Mexican lad that went to a church in the Argentine district of Kansas City. I knew the pastor quite well, and he told me about this. He said, I preached a message, and this one young man seemed really under conviction. But he, he didn't respond to the invitation. And he said, as he was leaving, I said, uh, young man, wouldn't you like to accept Christ as your personal Savior? Well, he said, uh, I'll talk to you about it tomorrow. And he used the word manana, tomorrow, manana, manana. He went out and hopped on his motorcycle. He tore off down that steep hill. There was a train coming out of the main station of Kansas City. It was one of those old uh, rocking uh, locomotives and it was already building up a lot of steam and going pretty fast. Well, he'd beat those things before and so he tried to beat that train but it was coming faster than he realized. It hit him. It cut his body in two. They came back up to Brother Potter and said, uh, Brother Charlie Potter, come down. Something terrible has happened. He went down there, and that young man's sister, who had invited him to church, who had hoped that he would trust in Jesus, had heard him say the word manana, and she threw herself over the largest portion of his bloody body and said, in crying and yelling out, manana, 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 Charlie! But it's too late. He turned down God's last invitation the poet put it this way there's a time I know not when a place I know not where that marks the destiny of men to heaven or despair there's a line by man unseen which crosses every path the hidden boundary between God's patience and his wrath to cross that limit is to die, to die as if by stealth. It may not pale the gleaming eye, nor quench the glowing health. The conscience may be still at ease, the spirit light and gay. That which is pleasing still may please, and care be thrust away. But on that forehead, God hath set indelibly a mark by man unseen, for man is blind and in the dark. And still the doomed man's path below may bloom like Eden bloomed. He did not, does not, will not know nor feel that he is doomed. He feels, he sees that all is well, his every fear is calm. But he lives and dies and wakes in hell. Not only doom, but condemn. Oh, where is that mysterious born by which each path is crossed, beyond which God Himself hath sworn that He who goes is lost? How long may man go on in sin? How long will God forbear? Where does hope end and where begin? The confines of despair. One answer from those skies is sent. 
ye who from God depart, repent while it's called today, and harden not your heart. those who reject God's invitation, the rebel who turns away from his offer has eternal loss. Can you just imagine eternal, 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 forever, forever, without hope, forever lost? It would seem that the demons would deride that wretched soul Say, cry on, thou cursed and ruined spirit, where there are no battlemented walls of towering jasper or pillars of gold to rest your weary pinions. Cry on throughout eternity. There is no respite. There is no rest. There is no peace. And the nearest of the forever doomed would only gnash upon you with their bitter anger and their blasphemous gasp of hatred. There are no friends in hell. There is no refreshing water there. There is no hope. There are no joys. There is no peace. There is no light of life, no presence of the Creator and the loving God. It's gone. It's too late. It's over. Forever. Forever. Eternity. Forever. Lost. Forever hopeless. So fly on and weep and wail for the God you rejected and the hope you denied will never, never trouble you again. Shall we stand? Heavenly Father, I pray that your spirit would make things clear and plain. And the people would realize the urgency of listening to your word and calling upon you that they might receive forgiveness and eternal life rather than in rejecting you finally be turned into eternal hell. Oh, thank you for mercy. Thank you for grace. Thank you for the opportunity of meeting here tonight and for Mercy Stream sending out the message around the world. Oh, we thank you for being the one who will save. Whosoever will may come. May it be so tonight that Christians would have a revived spirit, would be comforted, would be strengthened, and also challenged. And may it be that those who are here tonight have never yet trusted in you would not leave without trusting you and being saved to be eternally with you instead of being eternally lost. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be here in front to meet those who'd like to talk with us, who'd like to pray. Won't you come?
childhood you've heard the Holy Scripture that is able to make you wise unto salvation. Wow. I challenge you. Take what you've heard tonight back to your churches. It's the only answer to every problem there is in our nation and around the world is the gospel of Christ. I challenge you, share it with others. And when before the throne I stand join now. Jesus paid it all. I can't get enough of this. I think about back in the in the, the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, that great revival in the nation of Israel. You know how it started? Was it eight or nine days? The people stood as the different priests read the Word of God. It wasn't just a few moments. It was all day long. And then what about the Apostle Paul in the city of Ephesus? You remember what he did? Rented a hall in the school of Tyrannus for two years. And you know what it says after that? Every person in the city and in the region and the surrounding area heard. Now they didn't all come at once. They didn't all come the same night. Wow, for two years. I want to tell you something. If you will read God's Word every day, not just think about it. If you will read God's Word every day, it will change your life and it will change your love for the lost. You begin to realize how blessed you are. That your name is in the Lamb's book. You're forgiven. And you'll see your Savior face to face. And you'll live in His kingdom. Oh, I can't think of any. In fact, it is the absolute most important thing that you'll ever have in your life. Is your eternal destiny. Now, tonight's the last night. So please, take all that you've learned. All that you've heard. And share this. 
Yes. Yes. Uh, let's have a word of prayer first. Lord, I'm just a lay person, and uh, I have a story to share, and I pray that you'll give me the right words to say. I thank you for my Sunday school teacher, Dave Holland, to come and be stand with me. Uh, I have so much, and I think that it might be meaningful to, to uh, some of you tonight. I want to thank uh, Jimmy Porter for bringing us together as a community over the county, as Christians, so we can share with one another. I want to thank uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Anderson uh, for sharing their time with us. They've driven 60 miles uh, approximately every night to bring the word. And Lord, we just pray that you will keep them safe as they journey home tonight. And now, my story. I uh, accepted Christ uh, April 8, 1962. And uh, I'm a quiet Christian. I'm, I'm a sinner because I don't tell the word. But I had an experience in April of this year. And... Uh, I had a close call. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't tell anybody. I'd had a, a problem for probably a month or six weeks. So April 2nd, I, I'm a widower. I got in the car and I drove to North Kansas City Hospital. About 12 o'clock at night and 12.30, uh, my good doctor got a call to admit me. And uh, thank goodness they went to work on me. And three days, uh, I had four bypasses. And I called my friend uh, that I have, Marilyn Douglas, at uh, 8 o'clock that morning uh, on Sunday that uh, she usually comes to my house at 8.15 to go to Hoover Church. And I told her, I said, Marilyn, I'm not going to church today. I checked myself into the hospital. So, and I waited till later on in the morning to tell my children. I have a son and a daughter. And the word got around Platte City. I'm a long time resident. And uh, they couldn't believe. I've never drank. I've never smoked. Somebody healthy like me had four, going to have four bypasses. And uh, I, I was so fortunate that I had two doctors, uh, uh, Dr. Paul McKee. I, I attend, uh, used to attend First Christian when he was an interim pastor. I had two wonderful pastors overseeing me, Pastor Paul Bushman. And... Uh, Anyway, I got along good, and uh, a couple of days before I was to return home, I had uh, fluid on my left lung. And, uh, excuse me just a minute. Uh, so that extended my stay, up, my stay a couple more days. And uh, I got home. I was blessed so much with three... Uh, home health nurses that had at least 20 years experience with the hospital and uh, they were good Christian ladies and I got along good for 10 days <clears throat> then I developed pneumonia uh, I had to go back to the hospital for three days and I you can't believe how many times I prayed a lot of truth is, is that we pray more when we are have really serious problems. And but anyway, I pray every day. But I really prayed then. And uh, so after three days in the hospital, I come back home, and <clears throat> you know you have so much time when you're uh, 
convalescing around the house. And all I could think of was my good Christian friend, Laverne Tompey, that uh, we lost her in, in February uh, down at Big St. Luke's because she had had open heart surgery and she, she coughed so much from secondhand smoke. And all I could think of was, Lord, is it my turn? Is it my turn? But uh, I had a heart hunger. And people don't know what a heart hugger is, but it's a, it's a strap that goes around your chest. And uh, that saved my, helped save my life. Be, besides calling my wonderful doctor, Carl Myers, I have his cell phone number. I've only called him twice in 15 years. And Carl answered the phone. And I said, Carl, I've got to do something to make it through the night. Well, he told me what to do. And anyway, I made it. And uh, uh, Friday, I uh, have graduated from rehab after 36 sessions. And I've learned so much. But the gist is the story. I'm 78 years old. And I just thought that I needed to share this story with you you folks tonight and it, because I was so thankful that you know if I didn't make it I was going with Christ where my wife is but uh, if you have a chance to visit with your family and friends and tell them about Christ uh, it's, it's an inspiration uh, it was for me and I was so thankful that I was a Christian because I had good doctors and I had good nurses, but Christ and all the people praying for me brought me through. Thank you so much for letting me share my story with you. Thank you very much. We praise the Lord that He cares for each and every one of us. Thank you so much. Well, it's been a blessing getting the opportunity of being back with you. And uh, so we'll see you again, either here, there, or in the air. <laughs> sing this song and have a great evening. Don't forget, get you some cookies as you leave. Have so many blessings, yes we do. So much to be thankful for. When times get hard.